Many of you are probably already feeling the impacts of inflation, escalating gas prices. But now we have to worry about escalating food shortages. Since the start of the pandemic, we have seen a shortage of certain supplies and prices going up. And now we're barely out of the pandemic and we have a war breaking out. This is causing very serious problems around the world, notably a fertilizer shortage. You combine that with escalating gas prices and the prospect of international war. And it seems like things just keep getting worse. Now, I don't want to come here every day and tell you the apocalypse is upon us, but there are bad things. And perhaps the real issue is that every day it's just another grain of sand of something bad happening. As much as it may suck to hear all this stuff, at the very least, I hope you're informed about what may be coming. Because across the board, we are receiving warnings of a global food crisis, global food shortages. China is now preparing for a food shortage. Billionaires are warning, prepare now. Prices will be going up and it will become harder for you to find what you need. But it's not just food shortages. It's shortages across the board of basically everything. We here in the United States, we go through winters where we eat avocados and strawberries. That shouldn't be possible, but technology makes it possible. We can transport from Mexico avocados and from warmer regions fresh fruits and bring them up to colder climates where you can enjoy fruits all year round. But as resources are strained, as conflict escalates, as oil prices are still, they're, they're starting to go back up. The cost of everything is going to become immense and people are going to have to make sacrifices. But the one thing that really worries me right now, we sit on the precipice of what may be a kinetic World War Three. A lot of people say never going to happen. It's all saber rattling and posturing. Truth be told, I want to believe that, too. But when was the last time we saw a hot war in Europe? It's been some time. And with this prospect comes an opportunity for the U.S.'s adversaries to take advantage of the crisis and seek to exploit this time for their own personal gain. Right now, China is sending a, uh, war, war vessels, warships, through the Strait of Taiwan. They've already repeatedly entered the Taiwan air defense zone. And there is serious concern that because of the conflict in Ukraine, China will make its move. But I think there's other reasons to consider international war could erupt. One of the catalysts for revolution we've seen around the world is escalating food prices. And what happens... If one of these countries like China or Russia or even the U.S. sees a massive explosion in the cost of food, well, truth be told, Americans are a bit hefty around the waistline as it is, so we could go with uh, eating smaller portions, but not every single person. Eventually, you will come across that threshold where regular Americans say, I can't afford to eat anymore. And then what? I tell you what, man, as much as you have many people who are saying, no war, no war, Come after their food prices and watch how quickly many of these people will say, I will do anything you say, just please, I need to eat. I think the U.S. is a long way away from that. But China has a billion plus people to feed and they're fearing these food shortages. The U.S. is already getting cut off from fertilizer from Russia, which is where we mostly get it. And farmers are reporting on Twitter that their cost of fertilizer has gone up over two and a half times. What do you think that will mean for, mean for you and your meal and your family? If tensions continue to escalate in terms of car shortages, import short, you know, shortages of all electronic goods, food and fuel, well, I certainly think that people like perhaps you or I will likely be fine. Well, because we've been paying attention for one, but also because I assume most of you are a little bit more resilient. If you watch shows like mine and I'm constantly flailing my arms in the air, screaming civil war or, you know, World War Three or whatever, though it's a bit of an exaggeration. I do often talk about these issues. Y'all are probably prepared to a certain degree. You probably got survival kits. You've probably got emergency food. You've probably got an emergency survival guide downloaded on your phones. And if you don't, you should. But what about people in cities? What about the entitled city urban liberal types who think they should be able to make $50,000 a year writing pop culture content? Is it really worth all that much to provide so little to society? In my opinion, no, but they're likely going to maintain that sense of entitlement and carry it forward, at carry it forward as food becomes scarce. If it does get bad and does escalate, perhaps it could lead to well, to more tensions between countries that are already ready and willing to engage in serious international war. 
But let's get started here and go through what we're seeing with the looming food shortages, what the Washington Post says a global food crisis, and what China is worried about, escalating food costs. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com and become a member to help support my work as well as all of our journalists. As a member, you keep our journalists employed and we do fact checking and original reporting as well as aggregation every single day. Also, you'll get access to special episodes of the TimCast IRL podcast available only to our members. And with your membership, we're expanding the work we do. So if you really do want to support us, that's one way to do it. But also share this video. Post the URL wherever you can. It's the most powerful thing you can do. It's what keeps us afloat amid the massive censorship from YouTube and other platforms. I'm not kidding. You can feel it when they hit you. But you guys sharing th this content, it makes it impossible for them to just downrank us. Well, they, they downrank us, but they can't stop people from watching. But don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Let's read the first story from the New York Post. Looming food shortages is the next slow-moving disaster to hit the world. They write, food prices are already skyrocketing. Some, a lot, of this comes from inflation caused by runaway government spending over the past two years. Some is from supply chain issues. But a new problem is rearing its head. And government officials seem as likely to make it worse as to make it better. That problem is shortages of food and fertilizer brought about by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And by all means, we can blame Russia for this. I think that's fair. And the sanctions enacted by the West in response. Ukraine is a major wheat producer, but war is likely to ensure a poor spring planting and harvest. Russia is also a major grower, but sanctions and war will prevent it from exporting to most of the world. Russia is also a major manufacturer of fertilizer. In fact, it is the world's largest. Second on the list is China, a nation aligned with Russia and notably unfriendly to the US and the West. Canada is a distant third. That has people worried. Spring plant, fall harvest. You may not see anything until October. But I'll tell you this. I could be wrong about everything. I'm reading the news. Maybe these op-eds and these assessments could be wrong. There are many variables at play. Maybe next week, Vladimir Putin breaks down crying on TV and says, I was wrong to do this. I'm so sorry. Troops, everyone leave. And then everything goes back to normal. Do you think that'll happen? Probably not. But something could happen from now until planting season. And maybe, well, planting season's around the corner. But maybe something changes and the fall harvest is good. It stands to reason, if the U.S. cannot buy fertilizer from Russia, where we get a large percentage of it, if Ukraine cannot actually plant crops, then we're all going to see massive spikes in prices come fall and major shortages. Now, for those of you that are watching this video, you have a leg up. For those of you that read the news, you've probably been paying attention. And I think you all have an opportunity to, at the very least, keep it in mind, prepare how you see fit, and take care to make sure you're doing what you need to to survive. But I'm worried about people in these big cities who don't pay attention, who don't read the news, and have no idea what's coming. The worst case scenario. You know, I do those promos for safeandreadymeals.com sometimes. It's an emergency food thing. This is not a promo spot. I'm just mentioning it. And I, I tell people, look, if you have that, your worst case scenario, if you're wrong, is that you've got some food to eat. Your, your worst case scenario in general is that war actually breaks out and you're forced to eat it. But either way, it's food that lasts a long time. If you go out and take care of yourself right now, you're not going to regret it. You're just going to eat the food. So what? The New York Post goes on to say, the Green Market's North American Fertilizer Index, already high, jumped 16% last Friday. Urea, a major fertilizer ingredient, went up 22%. Now, let me stop right there, too, something they don't mention. For those that aren't uh, aware, urea is a major fertilizer ingredient, but it's also a component in, it's uh, what is it called, DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. In the United States, we've passed these laws, I think it was around 12 or so years ago, that diesel vehicles need to also fill up on DEF, which is made from urea. When we're driving our truck, because we have a diesel truck, we have to pull up to the pump, and they have two different pumps. They have fuel and DEF. If DEF becomes more expensive, it's not just about diesel costs or fuel costs when, when, when we're talking about transportation. You have many new tractor, you know, uh, semis, tractor trails, whatever you want to call them, that require DEF as well. When that price goes up, everything else will go up with it. They say, uh, DEF, uh, I'm sorry, ure urea went up 22%. Potash, another major ingredient, Russia being the top producer, increased 34% in Brazil the world's leading fertilizer importer. 
The price for standard starter fertilizer 1034-0 is up 49% from a year ago and likely to go much higher. Bloomberg analyst Alexis Maxwell calls it a slow-moving disaster. The issue is that farmland without fertilizer is vastly less productive. Without fertilizer, corn and wheat yields in the U.S. would decline by more than 40%. But as prices promise to go much higher, farmers will either have to skimp on fertilizer or raise prices of their own products a lot. It's not just that yield goes down and prices go up. If yield goes down, people need to eat. Prices won't be comparable to the decrease in yield. Like if if it goes down 40%, the prices would go up 40%. Oh, no, 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 no. When there's not enough food, prices will go insane. Then too, there are skyrocketing prices for gasoline and diesel, which are essential for today's mechanized farming and for getting food to consumers. And these increase in costs and decreases in production to the shortages likely to come from the Ukraine invasion. And we're looking at really dramatic increases in food prices. In the West, this will mean discomfort. Elsewhere, it will mean starvation. Bureaucrats aren't helping. Let me show you what the Washington Post says. The editorial board just published this op-ed. The war in Ukraine is triggering a global food crisis. Here's how the U.S. can help. You know, I got to be honest. I think we in the United States may tighten our belts a bit over the next several months. And we'll probably be fine. Seriously. Maybe many of these city urban liberal types will learn to live below their means and people will get out of cities and try and live a more humble life. For us, I'll tell you this. You know, I say that too much. I tell you this, but uh, um, I will add to the conversation. We got a bunch of chickens. We started with eight. Two of the babies didn't make it, unfortunately. We adopted another. Eventually, it turns out one of those chickens was a rooster. He started, you know, giving the business to the chickens. And now we have a lot. We have 12 new babies. We have uh, we had eight new babies. What are we looking at? 30, uh, 27 chickens right now. And, and here's the best part. Chicken feed isn't that expensive relative to, any, to, to, to food. And the chickens go and do their thing. But man, we have too many eggs. We have a lot of eggs. The conversion is fantastic. But you see, chickens are converting bugs plus the feed into food. I don't want to eat the bugs. Maybe you do. But uh, we don't take it all that seriously, to be honest. We could start taking our chickens seriously. We have Chicken City. For the most part, we're not even eating them yet, and we could be. Self-sustainability is going to be extremely important for everybody. I strongly encourage people to learn how to be sufficient on your own. We've got well water. We've got emergency solar power, and we have chickens. We can produce some of our food. I don't think the apocalypse is coming. I just think I would like to be responsible for myself. The concern I have in the big picture is war. From the South, what is this? Uh, uh, South China Morning Post. Ukraine invasion. China braces for effects of global fertilizer shortage on food security. SCMP reports a protracted war between Russia and Ukraine could damage the global fertilizer supply chain, putting pressure on grain prices and production in China during a key planting season. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization has warned of a possible worldwide food crisis as the war in Ukraine threatens production of key staple crops. Russia and Ukraine represent more than half of the world's supply of sunflower oil and about 30% of the world's wheat. China is largely self-sufficient in staple crops like wheat and rice, but the war is also driving up fertilizer prices. More than half of the potash, a key nutrient for major commodity crops that China consumes each year is imported, while customs data show that nearly 53% of potassium purchases last year came from Russia and Belarus, the largest and third, supply, uh, third largest suppliers to China, respectively. Moscow earlier this month recommended suspending fertilizer exports, while Lithuania and Ukraine have already banned transit of Belarusian potash through their ports. Ukraine, a major producer of agricultural products, also banned exports of fertilizers on Saturday. Quote, this will definitely have some impact on food security, said Xu Hongkai, deputy, probably pronounce, Hong Chai, probably pronouncing it wrong, deputy director of the Economic Policy Commission, under the China Association of Policy Science. If the trade of fertilizers and grain is interrupted, how can we do spring field work? How can we hold the rice bowls of our 1.4 billion population in our own hands? There will be a lot of trouble. The Farmers Daily, an official newspaper affiliated with the Chinese Agriculture Ministry, warned the war has fueled a spike in fertilizer prices, which are pushing up planting costs and eating into farmers' incomes. The global situation is complex. The supply of fertilizers is tight, 
and especially around the import of potash, there is greater uncertainty. The newspaper said in an article published on Wednesday, the article said the war has fueled a spike in fertilizer prices, which are pushing up planting costs and eating into farmers' incomes. Ultimately, my concern is, will China, the US, Russia, or otherwise, will they sit back and say, I understand population, you are struggling and suffering, but what can we really do about it? Or would China say, we will simply take what we need? I don't know. I don't think many of these great powers will sit back as their people starve, and it could potentially depose many of these these um, leaders. They're going to want to retain their power. How do they do it? Keeping their people happy. And that means they're going to need to send people off to war, or at the very least, they're going to say, "You are, are you mad? You want a solution? Go take the oil. Go take the fertilizer. We have this story from Fox Business. Billionaire supermarket CEO. Buy now. Food inflation will only get much worse. John Katsimatidis says food prices could increase by 20% this summer. At the very least, maybe war won't be the issue. Maybe you just won't be able to afford beef anymore. Quote, I've seen price increases coming through the month of March. I've seen them coming through April and May. Between price increases and shrinkflation, where it used to be 32 ounces, now it's going to be 28 ounces. It's anywhere from 12 to a 20% increase in food prices. The billionaire CEO encouraged Americans nationwide to stock up on their favorite products to get a better return on your investment, especially if prices soar over the, over the next three to four months. That's what I'm saying, right? That's why I think it's so funny. You know, people think that when I shout out safeandreadymeals.com that, uh, um, and I'm not doing a sponsored spot for them. You know, I just, that's the name of the website. That it's like the apocalypse is near, panic, 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 when it's really just like, oh, if you buy it now, it lasts a long time, and then you can eat it in a month, and it would have cost more. You see what I mean? Like, if it's going to cost you 100 bucks for your food now, and you wait a month to buy it, and it's 112 bucks, just buy it now, eat it in a month, it lasts forever. That's one way I look at things. You know, right, uh, right now, with inflation, outside of food and supplies, I'm buying everything I can. No joke. Some people have pointed out that, you know, I bought a sword and I've bought silver and gold recently. You know, I'll tell you why. I don't want to be sitting on U.S. dollars as mass inflation is hitting. Get hard assets. Here's the problem. It's easy for people of, mean and, of means and wealth to acquire hard assets. It's not easy for regular people. So what do you do? What does the, what does the average working class person do? I'm afraid I don't have the answers. There is going to be potential hyperinflation in our future. And when that happens and savings have been decimated, the rich will be holding hard assets, which won't decrease in value. The poor will have very little hard assets and their money will become worthless. And you will see some very, very steep and serious oligarchy in this country, worse than we've already got it. The Fed, of course, is raising interest rates for the first time in three years, projects six more hikes as inflation soars. They've increased key benchmark rate by 25 basis points. I hope you're prepared for what we're going to see. Gas, despite, look at this one from NBC, NBC Boston. Despite drop in world oil prices, gas prices remain high. And I'm seeing all these lefties being like, you see, this proves it's about greed. If the oil prices are going down, then gas prices should go down too. No, that doesn't make sense. Crude oil and gas do track to a certain degree. But you're not just going to see everything move in tandem. No, gas prices are remaining high. And oil is going back up. CNBC reports. Oil jumps as Russia-Ukraine talks stall. They say, oil prices were set for a second straight weekly loss, but found a floor above $100 a barrel on Friday after volatile trading this week with no easy replacement for Russian barrels in sight in a market already marked by tight supply. They say the supply crunch from traders avoiding Russian barrels, stuttering nuclear talks with Iran, dwindling oil stockpiles, and worries about a surge of COVID-19 cases in China hitting demand have combined to produce a roller coaster ride for crude prices. The volatility, volatility has scared players out of the oil market, which in turn is likely to exacerbate price swings. Russia said an agreement had yet to be reached after a fourth day of talks with Ukraine, during which some signs of progress had emerged earlier the week. Earlier in the week, President Putin appears unwilling to end hostilities. This should ensure that the energy complex remains well supported with plenty of scope for further volatility. He also said rising U.S. interest rates pointed to a stronger U.S. economy, which could underpin oil demand. 
after the Federal Reserve on Wednesday raised interest rates for the first time since 2018 and laid out an aggressive plan to push borrowing costs to restrictive levels next year. Go to Google, search for food costs, and you'll find more than enough stories to see that we've got a serious issue. We've got NBC Montana, the New York Post, Oregon Capital Chronicle, KSHB, CBS Miami. The reason I show the Google search on food costs escalating, rising, is because many of these stories are hitting localities. People are hearing about the local issues. And so I think people need to understand all of these small stories in these local, uh, in these local areas lend themselves to a national story. Food costs are through the roof everywhere. I'm worried about what comes next. In this story from, uh, what is this, um, International Policy Digest, U.S. agriculture is in crisis. They mention labor shortages. Yeah, blame COVID. Blame the Democrats' policy and some Republicans. And it's COVID itself keeping people out. Machinery costs are through the roof. Feed costs are through the roof. Fertilizer costs are through the roof. The need for political intervention, they say. I don't have all the answers for you, man. But the industry is in crisis. At least that's what they're saying here. Look at these cows. That cow right there in that picture, that looks like a worried cow. I'm kidding. I don't know. The cow probably doesn't know anything, doesn't care. But it is affecting more than just the United States. And I fear it's going to lead to desperation, anger, and crisis. From uh, financialtimes.com. From pasta shortage to run on iodine pills, panic buying hits Europe again. You take everything we've talked about with the conflict, with the crisis, with the escalation, the shortages, and you add in the panic buying, and I think it'll hit faster than you realize. We have every reason to believe that the food shortages will be bad this fall. Prices will go up this fall. But if people are seeing the news and they can anticipate it will get bad and they're watching videos like this, they may go out and panic buy. I don't recommend panic buying, but it's not about panic buying. See, that's what people understand. Some people think it's either you buy like normal or you panic buy. What happens if people calmly go out and buy supplies because they're worried about the future? That's not panic buying. Nobody's panicking and rushing in and throwing all the toilet paper in a bin like they were a couple years ago. You might go in and just fill up your cart with a couple weeks worth of food and say, better stock up now. But what happens when every single person does that? All of a sudden, you see supply chain crunch. All of a sudden, you start seeing empty store shelves. Prices start going up. And so it begins. I do love how Bloomberg and many outlets are trying to blame it all on Russia. How Russia's war in Ukraine is choking the world's supply of natural resources. Truth be told, Russia does deserve a lot of blame for this. That's a fact. But the reality is that things were getting bad before the invasion. Euronews.com reports global food prices had already hit record high. Then... Russia invaded Ukraine. They say when the Russian army launched its attack against Ukraine on February 24th, food prices worldwide were already at record highs. The war is likely to push them higher. Global food prices hit a record high in February, climbing 24% higher than they were at the same period the year before, following a 4% month, uh, month-on-month rise. The euro area has not been spared, with prices for food, alcohol, and tobacco uh, rising 4.1%. These sharp rises have been attributed to a variety of factors, primarily energy and transport. The cost for both of these has shot up over the past year, with demand for natural gas and shipping far outstripping supply as economies around the world shook off their COVID-19-induced stupor. Then Russia invaded its neighbor, falsely claiming the attack was necessary to prevent genocide by Ukrainian authorities, and the reaction on the markets was immediate. Just listen real quick. The reaction on the markets was immediate. This is what I've been trying to say about Joe Biden's policies and the Democrats. The left, of course, says it's all Putin's fault. Well, well, hold on there a minute, my friends. Joe Biden's policies, executive orders have an immediate impact on markets, which means people will start panic buying or selling. That's all a big factor here. I'm not going to blame Biden for every single thing that goes wrong. International conflict isn't the fault of one person, but policy matters. Leadership matters. Over in Russia, the Moscow Times reports Kremlin warns against panic buying as food prices rise fast. It is happening now. Shelves are empty. Prices are through the roof. And the Kremlin is warning, do not panic. But it's happening. Weird stuff's happening in Russia, to be completely honest. Russia suffering shortages, struggling to sustain troops. I want to throw this one in there just to say... Perhaps if Russia can't afford to feed their soldiers, there's not going to be a war and things might get back to normal. They say wars are fought on soldiers' bellies. If you can't keep your troops fed, what are you going to do? 
who's going to fight? People start starving. They desert and they'll go find food somewhere. The people in Ukraine have a lot of food to, to, to eat. Russian soldiers will have to seize areas and have food shipped in if they're to survive. Wars are not easily fought. Now, aside from all of this, we do have very weird repercussions of, uh, in terms of sanctions and how things are going on. But I, I, as much as these stories, these next couple of stories may be kind of weird and funny, I think the show's conflict is coming. Timcast.com reports, Russia aims to replace McDonald's locations with Uncle Vanya's restaurants. And you can see that they just flip the McDonald's logo over and clone it. Interesting. Russia continues to display resourceful forms of resistance to sanctions and protests over its invasion of Ukraine. Now, this story is rather simple. McDonald's has closed its doors in Russia, joining a group of companies exiting the country after it invaded Ukraine, but it may face trouble if it intends to reopen. We have this boycott subway calls grow as company continues doing business in Russia. And I think we also have, what is this one? Not this one. We have a, bur a story on Burger King. Burger King's refusing to back down. The reason why this McDonald's story I find interesting and, and think it, it's relevant is that Russia now is telling people to not worry about international treaties on copyright. This means Russians are going to easily just clone Western products and sell it on their own, creating a parallel global economy. They're already doing this with credit cards, with union pay, with China, with the Mir card. Visa and MasterCard now have global competition. Parallel economies. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, whatever country. They will be able to sustain themselves and keep their soldiers' bellies full while avoiding Western financial services. Once this happens, and it's possible to sustain these troops, you will see Russia and China wag their finger at the U.S. and say, you have no power here. It'll allow them to fight these wars. If Russia was unable to get fuel or food for their soldiers, there would be no war. So they're able to. With the expansion of Russia creating their own parallel economies, they will be more capable of doing so. But this will also cause conflict and chaos. It will result in shortages, prices going up, and could potentially lead to a reason for war. A bigger reason for war, to be completely honest. Russian Foreign Minister warns that anyone transporting weapons to Ukraine will be considered a legitimate military target. It's effectively a threat against the West because we were talking about delivering military jets and weapons. And I think we've been supplying Ukrainians with substantial amounts of resources and weapons. And Sergei Lavrov is basically saying, we'll consider you a le legitimate military target if we see you bringing this stuff in. More cause for war. The U.S., you know, probably through Poland. Poland starts delivering resources into Ukraine. Russia bombs them. Now NATO's involved. Maybe. Or maybe it goes to China. China, Chinese carrier sails through Taiwan Strait hours before Biden Xi call. That is a statement. We know what that means. Xi Jinping is effectively insulting Joe Biden before they have this call. So it could be China. China could decide we need Taiwan more than ever. With rising prices and the threat of war, China must be thinking they have to act now to secure their interests. And what are their interests? Well, Taiwan produces a ton of those silicon chips. China would love to control all of that. They don't right now. If the U.S. loses this, the cost of our imports will skyrocket. China will control the market on electronics. They can use this to gain a tremendous amount of power over other countries. And then what? Thucydides' trap, I suppose, a rising economic power, butting heads with a dominant power, and then it all goes to war. There are a lot of reasons to believe we're headed towards war. And maybe some might say, you said war was going to happen for this reason or that reason. You said civil war. Bah. Listen, just because we're talking about escalating food costs doesn't mean Taiwan and Ukraine don't play a role anymore. Just because there's a threat of international war doesn't mean civil war is off the table. We have right now Democrats suing to disqualify Republicans. In fact, this crisis very well may lead to an internal conflict in the U.S., don't look at me, man. I can't see the future. I'll tell you what I'm preparing for. Self-sustainability. The only thing I can really say is this. I'm, I'm, I could be wrong about so much of this stuff in terms of speculation. I can pull up these sources that are NewsGuard certified and say, look at that. Certified authoritative sources telling us what may be coming. Maybe my opinions on all of this are wrong. Maybe uh, my connecting the dots are wrong. The one thing I can, I, can, I can absolutely say is that when it came to the 2020 election, I saw the resentment and the sentiment among so many people who are willing to vote for Donald Trump. But I missed a big piece of the puzzle, and that was the hatred for Donald Trump.
I don't think I missed it as, uh, you know, um, alt. I, I don't think I did a bad job across the board, right? I was aware that enthusiasm against Trump was as high as enthusiasm for Trump, but I didn't believe so many people would be shooken out of their stupor or, you know, pushed into a stupor to go and vote for someone like Joe Biden. I didn't think he was going to gain that many votes. Donald Trump did gain around 10 million votes, but not enough to win. So I missed that. I very well be missing something here. But the one thing I can say, when it comes to making predictions and preparing for the future, my business has been remarkably successful. Things that I told other big companies to do 10 years ago have come to fruition today and greatly benefited me. I told Vice, get your hosts and personalities to do straight to the camera conversations on their thoughts and opinions about these stories, and you will see massive channels with new celebrities and new stars, and you'll have a massive footprint. They didn't do it. I said the same thing to Fusion. They didn't do it. I go my own way. I take my own advice. It's wildly successful. I was right to leave New York when I did. I was right to leave Jersey and, and the South Philly, uh, the Philly suburbs when I did. And here I am now in the middle of nowhere, taking care of ourselves, and we've been all the better off for it. We didn't get locked down in our cubicles. We weren't confined to our homes. We are in the vast openness of Western Maryland and West Virginia. I can't say that I can predict the future or anything like that. I just think that, you know, five, uh, let's say 50.1% of the time, I get it right. I have a tendency to just get some of it right more than I get it wrong, but I get a lot wrong. And that just means that for me, well, I'm prepared and chance favors the prepared. I don't know what you should do because I don't know where you live, but you should probably be making sure that you can survive a storm at the very least. You should probably download a survival guide. You should probably get away from cities. Things seem to be getting bad or going from bad to worse. I don't know where it will end up, but I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.